Well, what a beautiful picture this morning, our choir of multi-generational worship, young and old, united together, crying out, lifting high the name of Jesus Christ. It makes us think of Palm Sunday, that triumphal entry when the multitude is shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And as Mark alluded to, there was a sect, the leadership there in Jerusalem, who pressed Jesus and told him, you better quiet them. You better quiet them. They better hush. They cannot cry out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And Jesus looked and simply said, I tell you the truth, that if they do not cry out, rocks will cry out in their place. Listen to me this morning. You have been created in the image of God. You have been given a voice. You have been given this longing to be connected with your creator. A voice that cries out, Jesus. Jesus, Hosanna is he, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We enter into Passion Week. We move towards Good Friday. We move towards the greatest week and the greatest events in the history of the world. We are going to move this week from Jesus' triumphal entry to his crucifixion on the cross, to his resurrection from the dead. He is worthy of your time, your attention, your affection. He is worthy of you thinking critically and rightly about all the events that surrounded his death. In his resurrection, there is a detail I want to call your attention to this morning, a detail that you may be aware of, but I bet you have not spent considerable time contemplating or thinking much about it. That is the detail of what I propose to you, that Jesus was the silent lamb of God, the silent lamb. Lamb of God, that through trial after trial, Jesus sat there in silence. It is worthy of your contemplation this morning. Listen as I read Matthew 27, 11 through 14. It says, now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor questioned him, saying, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said to him, it is as you say. And while he was being accused by the chief priests and the elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, do you not hear how many things they testify against you? And he did not answer him with regard to even a single charge. And so the governor was quite amazed. Will you pray with me? Our heavenly father. You are worthy of all of our worship. You are worthy of all of our praise. Just for who you are alone, you are worthy. Because you are the creator, you are the sustainer. You are the beginning and the end. But how much more so because you sent your son? How much more so because your son's death compels us? It draws us near to you. How much more so then? We pray right now in Jesus' name that through the power of the Holy Spirit that you would speak to us through your word, that you would draw our mind's eye to the scene, to the most critical point in all of human history where you were the silent lamb of God. We pray all of that in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Ted Bundy was one of the most notorious ser- serial killers in all of American history. He committed more than 30 homicides between seven states over a five year period of time. Despite these horrific crimes, Bundy, uh, who was wildly charismatic, he was good looking, he was charming. He defended himself in court, which only added to the wild cult-like fanfare that he had. Now, Bundy always maintained and insisted upon his innocence. He made appeal after appeal for 11 years as he awaited on death row. That is, up until his final appeal... (coughs) up until his final appeal was denied, just weeks before his execution date. And then suddenly, he had a complete change of heart. Suddenly, he confessed to more than 30 murders and pleaded for three years' stay so that he might finally begin to give the details and accounts of all the murders and all the whereabouts. Ted Bundy's lawyer argued like this. Ted feels morally compelled as he faces death to do the right thing in terms of resolving any investigation. You see, even serial killers, their unyielding instinct is to deny, deflect, prolong, and self-defend even to the very end. And now I want you to listen to the scriptural account of the innocent Son of God. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before its shears, so he did not open his mouth. You see, Jesus, when facing death, was the silent Lamb of God. Let us begin with the scene in the Garden of Gethsemane. It is the night of his betrayal. And Jesus will go to the garden to make one final plea. The gravity, the enormity of the situation has begun to overwhelm him. Where he feels compelled, he must pray and plead with God one final time. He falls to his knees, his heart pounding, racing. He can't catch his breath. The situation is so intense, as he feels the weight of it, he begins to sweat blood. He will pray for hours. The gospel writers give us just a snippet, a summary of what he prayed. And it sounded like this. Abba, Father. Father, I beg you. If there is any way that this cup could pass from me, any way you could make it happen, Yet not what I will, but what you will. For hours, he prays. And then shockingly, given the emotion, the time spent in prayer, shockingly, he rises with a resolve gathers his disciples, gathers himself, and says, get up, 
Let's get going. The one who betrays me is at hand. Get up. Let's get going. Words that could signal it's time to run away. But here they signal the opposite. Because Jesus is running towards, presenting himself. You see, in the garden, Jesus presents himself as the Lamb of God. He rises to meet Judas and the mob. He addresses them first. Whom do you seek? He hurries Judas along. Friend, do what you've come for. Adam hid in the garden. Adam hid in shame and guilt. You and I hide all the time, wanting to avoid the consequences, hoping the cop gets the car in front of us. Adam hid, and yet Jesus presented himself in the garden. Furthermore, you must understand that the lamb goes Willingly. When the guards grab him, Peter rises up in defense. He's ready for a fight to the death. He strikes so close that he cuts a servant's ear off, but Jesus stops the entire situation, heals the servant's ear, turns to Peter and says, Do you not understand that at this very moment, I could call 12 legions of angels if I wanted. John tells us that Jesus goes willingly and tells the mob, let my disciples go. And the lamb remains silent. Now, when we talk about the silence of Jesus during his passion, we don't mean that he didn't utter one word. Rather, what we mean is that he did not offer self-defense, that there was no self-justification, no explanation for his actions or the charges pressed against him, that he was the silent lamb of God. That night of Jesus' arrest in the garden, they took him to the high priest Caiaphas' house where the Sanhedrin had secretly gathered together in what they would think is an emergency meeting, an emergency trial. But it is anything but legal and it is anything but just. Witness after witness came forward with wild accusations, just hoping something, anything might stick. Matthew 26, the high priest stood up and said to him, do you not answer? What that these men are testifying against you? Do you not answer? But Jesus kept silent. Put yourself in his shoes. sham of a trial in the middle of the night, witnesses lying, saying things you've never said, attacking your character, put yourself there. Yet Jesus remained silent. Peter is yards away. Denying Jesus with a raised voice. Calling down curses from God. I am cursed of God if I tell him I'm not telling you the truth. I promise you, I do not know the man. And all Jesus does is turn and make eye contact with Peter. The next morning, as they carry the charges... Before Pilate, 
Matthew 27 reads, and while he was being accused by the chief priests and the elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, do you not hear how many things they testify against you? And he did not answer him with regard to even a single charge. So the governor was amazed. Pilate, hoping to find the crowd more reasonable, presents Jesus to them. But in in a, a shocking contrast from Jesus, the crowd shouts, crucify him, crucify him. You see, with threats of violence, the mob demands to be heard. And there stands the silent Lamb of God. Pilate will cry out in his place, saying, why? What has he done? Pilate is so stunned by Jesus' lack of response, he pulls him into a back room and again questions him. But Jesus gives him no answer. Do you not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you or to crucify you? Even while he hangs on the cross, stripped naked between two thieves, he never offers a defense. Rather, he prays for his executioners. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The crowd hurls abuse at him. The chief priests mock him. Even one of the thieves on the cross next to him joins in in the slander. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. You see, the Lamb of God remains silent even to his last groan. This is utterly amazing. Something that requires your full attention. Why is Jesus so intentionally silent? Have you ever thought about that before? Why is it so theologically significant that scripture repeatedly draws our attention to it? If it were you, would you be silent? Think about your own self-justifying nature. It was some time ago that I was watching the the TV show Shark Tank. I don't watch a whole lot of TV, but that is one of those shows that I kind of like. If you're not familiar with it, it is there's there's these uh, five or six uh, incredible businessmen and women and entrepreneurs come before them and present their idea in hopes to get uh, a buy in from this great business mind to help them with their business and and the company as they move forward. Well, there was a particular episode where uh, a a guy had a personal uh, water filter. And it it was a great idea that you could personalize your water filter from area to area. And uh, he had come there to get a deal with Mark Cuban. Now, they they go through all the discussion, and a couple of them had already gone out, and Mark gives him an offer. Now, that's what you want on on the tank. That means you you got an offer from a businessman who's going to help take your your business to the entire next level. And Barbara, who sits next to Mark, said, I'll clear the air. I'm out also. And, And that left only Mark in. Now, as Barbara was going out, though, she took a shot at the man's leadership. And she basically said, I wouldn't want to work with you because I don't think you're a leader. Well, in hearing Barbara go out, now that Mark's the only one with an offer, 
the man begins to argue and defend himself to Barbara. Now, Mark, who's sitting there, is, is saying, hey, hey, wait, wait a second, I've given you an offer, stop arguing with Barbara. But he doesn't stop there. He, he wants to, he's insulted that she has said something against him. And so he begins again to defend himself. Now Mark yells at him and says, no, no, no. You either accept my offer or I'm going out. So the guy gets focused and he goes and accepts Mark's offer. He's just made a shark tank deal. All right, his life is going to forever change. He has Mark Cuban at, now on his team. Watch out, here you go. And instead, so he goes up and he hugs Mark Cuban. There's this exciting moment, but he just can't help himself because after he gives Mark a hug, uh, Barbara is standing right there and he immediately goes back to defending himself with Barbara. I submit to you that every single one of us have that sort of self-justifying nature. That everything we do is to hide, deflect, or defend, to cover our own skin. So why is it that Jesus is the silent lamb of God led to slaughter. Two reasons, and then we're done. First of all, Jesus is silent because he stands in the silence of the condemned. In the book of Romans, Paul wants to articulate the gospel. And he spends the first three chapters trying to show you how in the law, in your own effort, no man will be justified before God. And he drives home the argument and he says things like, listen to me, there is none who seeks for God. No, not one. Not even one who genuinely seeks for God. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But in Paul's developing argument, as he's piecing the whole thing together, in chapter 3, verses 19 and 20, he gives this snapshot before he presents Jesus. He gives this snapshot That every one of us at the end of our lives will stand before God as the judge on the throne. And the book of your life will be opened. It will be a public display of all of your deeds. Everything you've ever thought, everything you've ever said, everything you've ever done. Your book will be opened. And in that moment... Paul says, you will be silent. Absolutely silent. It will be unlike anything you've ever experienced. Because you and I spend our whole lives trying to self-justify, trying to go through every situation and go, but, 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 but wait, do you know what she did? But no, 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 that's not exactly how it played out. But when God opens the book and all of your deeds are read, your mouth will be silent. It's the silence of the condemned. Jesus made his final and only plea in the garden before his heavenly father, before the one who truly rules and reigns from heaven. Not here on earth, not the Sanhedrin, not Pilate. Before them, he didn't even utter a word. Why? Because he stood in the silence of your condemnation. He stood in the silence of your condemnation. And he had resolved himself. 
to take that on on your behalf. Secondly, Jesus carried our shame. The Bible teaches that when Jesus took our sin, that he took all the punishment that goes with it. And part of that punishment is shame. How many times during Jesus' ministry did they try and trap him? Did they try and put him to shame? And yet with one simple, single reply, they fold like a cheap tent. You do these miracles by the power of the devil. A house divided itself cannot stand. If you were the Messiah, you you would know that, that you would not hang out with sinners. It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Attempting to stone a woman caught in the very act of adultery, Jesus stoops down and draws in the sand. He who is without sin cast the first stone. And they all vanish. Time after time, they set the trap and he pops it like a bubble. But in his final hours, he presented himself. He goes willingly and he remains silent. You see, he humbly accepted the shame of our sin. No defense as he's falsely accused and repeatedly lied about. He's silent in the shame of accusation. No self-justification as he's scourged and mocked as they put a crown of thorns and drape him in a purple robe. He's silent in the shame of public mocking. No rebuttal as the crowd spits out its venom, demands his crucifixion. He's silent in the shame of a criminal's condemnation. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shears, So he did not open his mouth. But whereas a sheep is dumb and unsuspecting, knows not what's going on, the same cannot be said of Jesus. He knows. He knows Isaiah's prophecy about him. He has set his face towards Jerusalem. He has repeatedly told his disciples about his upcoming crucifixion. He stopped Peter there in the garden and said, put up your sword. He reminds Pilate, you only have authority over me because my kingdom is not of this world. Again and again. We see Jesus' willingness to remain silent and submit to his Father's will. In fact, he's so noticeably silent before the Sanhedrin, before Pilate, before the crowd. He's so noticeably silent whenever he's being mocked, whenever he's being scourged. The fact that he never addresses the crowd, he's so noticeably silent that it draws your attention to what he does say. Do you know what the scripture records? That the first thing Jesus said after he was nailed to the cross, after he was lifted up and suspended nine feet above the earth, do you know what the scripture says? The first thing he said was, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Father, forgive them, 
Friend, I tell you plainly that Jesus was silent on your behalf. He was silent in the condemnation of your sin. He was silent in the shame of your sin. And that he is willing to utter those very words on your behalf. Father, forgive them and insert your name there. He is willing to take all of your sin, all of your shame upon himself. He is willing to stand before God on judgment day. Stand at your right side and declare, Father, forgive them. But you must understand that there is a difference between forgiveness offered and forgiveness applied. Jesus offers to all, to anyone who calls upon his name, he offers forgiveness. He offers to utter those words on your behalf. But it requires a response from you. It requires a belief from you. It requires you being willing to step out and call upon his name. Friend, has there ever been a time in your life when you have called upon the name of Jesus? When you have called upon him, when you have seen that his death on the cross was in your stead, when you have seen that he was silent on your behalf, that he was the lamb of God, because otherwise you will stand before God on judgment day and your book will be opened and your charges will be read and you will be silent because you will have nothing to say in reply. Or, or you can understand that Jesus was silent on your behalf, that Jesus, through the trial, through the crucifixion, through the scourging, through it all, through all the mocking, he was silent on your behalf. And you right now, in your heart of hearts, would hit your knees and cry out, Jesus, not only did you die in my place, Jesus, I will make you king. Jesus, I will make you king. That's what it means to be saved. You have to understand that Jesus died in your place and you are willing to make Jesus your king. What would it look like if Jesus became your king? What would change in your life if you understood that he was king? See, there's forgiveness that's offered And then there's forgiveness that's applied. I ask everyone now to bow your heads and close your eyes. If you are at home, bow your heads and close your eyes and just let me talk to you. Friend, do you know? Do you know that you know that you know that you are saved? Are you trusting in the finished work of Jesus Christ, in his death, in his resurrection, and not your own? Do you really want to stand before God on your own? Do you really want to stand on your own merit? Or will you heed the warning of scripture? You will be silent. Or you can call upon the name. The only name that has been given under heaven by which you must be saved. You can call upon the name of Jesus Christ. And he will declare on your behalf, Father, forgive them. But you have to be willing to make him king. Will you do business with God right now? Will you call upon the name of Jesus? Will you surrender?
Lord Jesus, I pray for anyone under the sound of my voice that your Holy Spirit would do what only you can do. Would you call men and women to yourself? Would you allow them to sense all that you went through on their behalf? Would you right now forgive those who are calling out to you? We pray all of this in your holy name, Jesus. Amen. Friend, the praise team's up here to sing one final song. And it's a chance for you to respond. It's a chance for you to, with your mouth, declare the greatness of Jesus Christ. He was silent so that right now you could shout his name. If during that response time you prayed and you asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and your Savior, if you called upon his name, I beg you, let somebody know. We'll have pastors down here at the front who would love to pray with you. If you don't feel comfortable with that, I, I get it. You can meet me after the service. We'll have Kathy and the Connections team in the plaza or in the foyer. It's the most important decision you could ever make. And he is worthy. He is worthy of you speaking up. See, he was silent on your behalf. And now you, church, get to respond.